Today, we're diving deep into a game-changing book, The Startup Owner's Manual, the step-by-step -step guide for building a great company. Now, before you roll your eyes thinking, oh great, another startup book, let me tell you, this one is different. It challenges the conventional wisdom that startups are just mini versions of large companies. Newsflash, they're not. Startups are a whole different animal with their own unique path to growth, and that path is paved with exploration, iteration, and a relentless search for a repeatable, profitable business model. First things first, let's talk about the geniuses behind this book. Steve Blank, the main author, is a seasoned entrepreneur who's been in the trenches, having founded Deed, yes, you heard that right, eight startups. That's a lot of battle scars and hard-earned wisdom. His first book, The Four Steps to the Epiphany, is like the startup bible, revered by entrepreneurs and investors worldwide. And then there's Bob Dorf, his co-author, who's founded seven companies himself and invested in a dozen more. These guys know their stuff. So, what groundbreaking insights does the Startup Owner's Manual have in store for us? Well, it dishes out five core ideas that could seriously boost your odds of startup success. We're talking about game-changing stuff here, not your run-of-the-mill advice. This book is like a treasure map, guiding you through the treacherous waters of starting a business. First and foremost, it hammers home the idea that startups are not just a series of untested guesses. Your success hinges on how well you can turn those guesses into cold, hard facts. It's all about transforming the unknown into the known. Sounds simple, right? Well, it's not. But fear not, because this book is here to show you how. Next up, the book stresses that you, the founder, need to get your hands dirty. No more hiding behind your computer screen. You've got to get out there, into the trenches, where your customers live and work. That's where the real insights lie. You need to dive deep into your customers' needs, pains, and desires. This is not a job you can outsource. It's your baby, your vision. So roll up your sleeves and start digging. But hey, don't think you need to build some fancy, feature-rich product right off the bat. The book introduces the concept of the Minimum Viable Product, MVP. It's like your product's bare bones, just the essential features. You build that, test it with real customers, and then iterate like crazy based on their feedback. Build, measure, learn, repeat. That's the startup groove. Now here's a nugget of wisdom that's often overlooked. Your market type determines everything. Are you entering an existing market, resegmenting a market, creating a brand spanking new market, or cloning a market? Each path comes with its own set of challenges and strategies. Figure out where you stand and tailor your approach accordingly. Last but not least, the holy grail of startup success. Finding a repeatable, profitable business model before you run out of dough. It's not just about making a cool product that people love. It's about making money consistently and scalably. That's the end game. And this book shows you how to get there step by step. So there you have it, folks. Five powerful ideas that could rewrite your startup story. But hey, don't just take my word for it. Grab a copy of the Startup Owner's Manual, dive in and see for yourself. Your future self will thank you. Now, I know this was a lot to digest in one sitting, but stick with me because in the coming segments, we're going to unpack each of these ideas one by one. We'll dive into real-world examples, actionable strategies, and practical tips you can start using today. By the end of this, you'll have a whole new perspective on what it takes to build a successful startup. You'll be armed with the knowledge and tools to blaze your own trail, to carve out your own unique path to success. So buckle up, grab a notebook, and let's get started on this thrilling ride through the pages of the Startup Owner's Manual. Trust me, your entrepreneurial journey will never be the same.
All right, let's dive into the first core idea that the Startup Owner's Manual throws at us. The notion that startups are not businesses, but a series of untested hypotheses. This is a biggie, so pay attention. You see, the fundamental difference between a startup and an established company is that the latter has a known, proven business model. They know who their customers are, what to sell them, and how to make money doing it. It's like they have the cheat codes to the game. But startups, they're playing a whole different ball game. Their business model is a big fat question mark. They're making educated guesses about their customers, their product, their market, and their monetization strategy. It's all hypothetical at this point, and that's where most startups go wrong. They treat these guesses as gospel truth, as if they were handed down on stone tablets from the startup gods. They pour their blood, sweat, and tears, not to mention their precious funding, into executing these assumptions without ever stopping to test them. It's like setting out on a cross-country road trip with a map you drew based on your best guesses. You might have a general idea of the direction you need to go, but without validating your route against reality. You're likely to end up hopelessly lost, out of gas, and with a car full of angry, hungry passengers. The book drives this point home with a stark reality check. A startup's business plan is nothing more than a beautifully formatted list of unproven assumptions. It's a fairy tale, a bedtime story you tell investors to get them to fund your dream. But the real work, the meat and potatoes of a startup, is in turning those assumptions into facts. It's about taking your hypotheses out into the real world and putting them to the test. It's about embracing the unknown and learning to navigate through uncertainty. This means you've got to be willing to be wrong, to have your assumptions challenged and your ego bruised. You've got to develop a healthy relationship with failure, seeing it not as a personal shortcoming, but as a necessary step on the path to truth. The book illustrates this beautifully with the example of the traditional product development model. In this model, you start with a concept, develop a product based on that concept, test it to make sure it works as intended, and then launch it to the world with great fanfare. Sounds logical, right? But here's the catch. This model assumes you already know exactly what your customers want. It assumes you've got your finger on the pulse of the market, that you're some sort of mind-reading product guru. But the reality is, most startups don't have a clue what their customers really want or need. They're making shots in the dark, hoping to hit a bullseye. And more often than not, they miss the mark entirely. That's why the book advocates for a different approach, the customer development model. In this model, you start by admitting that you don't have all the answers. You develop hypotheses about your customers and your market, and then you get out of the building and start testing those hypotheses. You talk to real potential customers, observe their behaviors, dig into their pain points and desires. You use this real-world feedback to refine your hypotheses, pivoting your strategy as needed and you keep at it, iterating and adapting until you've zeroed in on a business model that works. This is not a linear process. It's messy, unpredictable, and often frustrating, but it's also the only way to build a startup on a foundation of truth rather than wishful thinking. And here's the kicker. This process never really ends. Even after you've found a business model that works, you've got to keep validating it, keep adapting to the ever-changing landscape of the market. Complacency is the kiss of death for a startup. So, to all you entrepreneurs out there, take this to heart. Your startup is not a business, not yet. It's a grand experiment, a quest for truth in a world of uncertainty. Embrace that uncertainty, question your assumptions, and never stop searching for the facts that will guide you to success. In the next section, we'll explore how to actually go about this process of customer discovery and validation. 
we'll look at some practical strategies and real-world examples of startups that have navigated this path successfully. But for now, let this sink in. Your startup is not what you think it is. It's an evolving hypothesis, a work in progress. And your job is not to execute a predetermined plan, but to discover the plan that reality has in store for you. It's a challenging path, no doubt, but it's also an incredibly exciting one, full of learning, growth, and the potential for game-changing breakthroughs. In our last segment, we uncovered the first core idea from the Startup Owner's Manual, that startups are not mini-versions of established businesses, but rather a series of untested hypotheses. We learned that the key to startup success lies not in flawless execution of a predetermined plan, but in the relentless pursuit of validating and refining our assumptions. But how exactly do we go about this? How do we test our hypotheses and gather the real-world insights we need to build a viable business? Well, buckle up, because the second core idea from the book is about to take us on a wild ride outside our comfort zones. Steve Blank and Bob Dorff, in all their startup wisdom, declare that founders must get out of the building. No, they're not advocating for open-air office spaces or walking meetings, although those might not be bad ideas. What they mean is that you, the founder, need to step away from your computer, your whiteboard, your meticulously crafted business plan, and venture out into the real world where your customers live and work. This is not a task you can delegate to underlings or outsource to a market research firm. This is a mission that demands your personal attention and engagement. Why? Because as the founder, you are the heart and soul of your startup. Your vision, your passion and your assumptions are what drive the business forward. If those assumptions are wrong, if you're not in tune with the real needs and wants of your customers, then all the hard work and clever strategies in the world won't save you from failure. The book is filled with cautionary tales of startups that fell into this trap. Take, for example, the infamous Segway, invented by the brilliant engineer Dean Kamen. The Segway was supposed to revolutionize personal transportation. Cayman assumed that cities would eagerly adapt their infrastructure to accommodate this new wonder device. He assumed that consumers would happily shell out thousands of dollars for a chance to glide effortlessly down the sidewalk. But those assumptions, as compelling as they might have seemed in the echo chamber of Cayman's lab, didn't hold up in the real world. Cities balked at the idea of Segway-friendly infrastructure, Consumers found the device too expensive, too awkward, and too geeky for mainstream appeal. The Segway, for all its technical brilliance, failed to find a viable market. Now, imagine if Cayman and his team had followed the advice in the Startup Owner's Manual. Imagine if, instead of charging ahead with production and marketing based on their own assumptions, they had first taken the time to deeply engage with potential customers, they might have discovered early on that their vision, as exciting as it was, didn't align with the realities of urban transportation and consumer behavior. They could have pivoted, adapted, and perhaps found a different path to success. This is the power of getting out of the building. It's not just about gathering data points or validating features. It's about developing a deep, empathetic understanding of your customers' lives, challenges, and aspirations. It's about seeing the world through their eyes and allowing their insights to shape your business from the ground up. And here's the thing, this process never ends. Even after you've launched your product, even after you've found some initial traction, you need to keep going back to the well of customer insight. Markets shift, needs evolve, and your business needs to evolve with them. The startups that succeed in the long run are the ones that never lose touch with their customers, that never stop learning and adapting. So, how do you actually go about this process of customer discovery? The book offers some practical tips. 
Start by identifying your core assumptions about your customer segments, their needs, your value proposition, your channels, and your revenue streams. Write these down and then start crafting experiments to test them. These experiments might take the form of in-depth interviews, surveys, or even simple landing pages that gauge interest in your concept. The key is to design them in a way that gives you measurable, actionable insights. And don't be afraid to get creative. Some of the best customer insights come from unconventional approaches, like shadowing customers in their daily lives or even working in their jobs for a day. As you gather feedback, be prepared to iterate and pivot. Don't get too attached to your original ideas. Remember, your goal is not to prove yourself right, but to find the truth that will guide you to a viable business model. This is hard work. It's uncomfortable, uncertain, and often frustrating, but it's also the most important work you'll do as a startup founder. Because when you truly understand your customers, when you've built your business around their real needs and desires, that's when magic happens. That's when you create something not just profitable, but truly meaningful and impactful. So get out there, talk to people, observe, listen, learn. The answers you seek are not in your building, but out in the world where your customers are waiting to be understood and served. In our next segment, we'll dive into the third core idea from the Startup Owner's Manual, the power of the minimum viable product. We'll learn how to turn our customer insights into tangible, testable products that can accelerate our learning and growth. But until then, your homework is to start drafting your own customer discovery plan. Identify your assumptions, design some experiments, and get ready to step out of your comfort zone. The game is afoot and your customers are waiting. We also know that the key to testing these hypotheses is to get out of the building and engage deeply with our potential customers. But what do we do with all this customer insight? How do we turn it into a real tangible product? This is where the third core idea from the book comes in. The concept of the minimum viable product, or MVP. Now, when most people hear the term MVP, they think of the most valuable player, the star of the team. But in the startup world, MVP means something quite different. It's not about being the biggest, the flashiest, or the most feature-rich. In fact, it's quite the opposite. An MVP is the most basic version of your product that allows you to start the process of learning and validating your assumptions. It's the bare minimum you need to put in front of customers to gauge their response and gather valuable feedback. Think of it like this. If you were opening a restaurant, your MVP wouldn't be a full five-course menu with a wine list and a fancy dessert cart. It would be more like a food truck, serving up a few core dishes and seeing how customers respond. You'd use that feedback to tweak your recipes, your pricing and your overall concept before investing in a full-scale restaurant. The same principle applies to any startup, whether you're building an app, a hardware device or a new service. Your MVP is your test kitchen, your lab, your proving ground. It's where you experiment, learn, and refine your ideas based on real customer feedback. Now, building an MVP is not about cutting corners or delivering a subpar product. It's about ruthless prioritization, about stripping away anything that isn't essential to delivering your core value proposition. It's about focusing on the one thing your product must do exceptionally well to win over customers. This is harder than it sounds. As founders, we're often in love with our own ideas. We want to pack in every cool feature, every bell and whistly we can imagine. But the harsh reality is, most of those features don't matter to customers, at least not initially. They're just noise, distractions from the core problem you're trying to solve. The book offers a great example of this with the story of Zappos, the online shoe retailer. 
When founder Nick Swinmurn first had the idea for Zappos, he didn't rush out to build a fancy e-commerce platform with all the trimmings. Instead, he put up a basic website with pictures of shoes from local stores. When a customer ordered a pair, Nick would run down to the store, buy the shoes and ship them out himself. This was Zappos' MVP. It wasn't scalable, it wasn't automated and it certainly wasn't efficient. But it allowed Nick to test his core hypothesis that customers would be willing to buy shoes online without investing in a ton of infrastructure up front. And the feedback he got from those early customers helped shape Zappos into the billion-dollar business it is today. The lesson here is clear. Your MVP is not your final product. It's a learning tool, a way to test your riskiest assumptions and gather the insights you need to build something customers truly want. And once you have that MVP, you need to get it in front of customers as quickly as possible and start the cycle of feedback and iteration. This is where the concept of agile development comes in. Unlike traditional product development, which can take months or even years and deliver a final product that may or may not meet customer needs, agile development is all about speed, flexibility and continuous improvement. With Agile, you build your MVP, release it to customers, gather feedback, and then immediately start working on the next iteration. You're not trying to get it perfect the first time. You're trying to get it out there, learn from it, and make it better with each cycle. This can be a tough pill to swallow for perfectionists or those used to more linear, structured approaches to product development. But in the fast-paced, unpredictable world of startups. Agility is a non-negotiable. You simply can't afford to spend months or years perfecting a product that might not even be what customers want. So, to recap, your MVP is your starting point, your bare minimum that allows you to start learning from customers. And agile development is your process, your way of turning that learning into continuous improvement and refinement but building an MVP and embracing Agile is just the beginning. To truly succeed, you need to deeply understand your market and how your product fits into it. And that's where the next core idea from the Startup Owner's Manual comes in, the importance of market type. In our next segment, we'll dive into the four main market types outlined in the book and explore how each one impacts your startup strategy. We'll look at real-world examples of startups that have succeeded and failed in each type of market and extract some key lessons you can apply to your own journey. But for now, your task is to start defining your own MVP. What is the core value proposition of your product? What's the minimum feature set you need to test your key assumptions? And how can you get that MVP in front of customers as quickly as possible? Remember, your MVP is not your final destination. It's your jumping off point, your first step in the iterative dance of building something customers love. Embrace the process, learn from your customers, and never stop improving. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Let your MVP be that step, and let's see where this exciting path takes us next. We explored the power of the Minimum Viable Product, MVP, and how it can help you start the learning process with your customers. We also touched on the importance of agile development, the iterative process of continuously improving your product based on customer feedback. But as you're building and refining your MVP, there's another crucial factor you need to consider, your market type. This is the fourth core idea from the Startup Owner's Manual, and it's a biggie. You see, not all markets are created equal. The strategies and tactics that might work brilliantly in one type of market could fall flat in another. Understanding your market type is like understanding the rules of the game you're playing. Without that knowledge, you're just shooting in the dark. So what are these mysterious market types? The book outlines four main ones. 1. 
existing market. 2. Resegmented market. 3. New market. 4. Clone market. Let's break these down one by one. An existing market is just what it sounds like. A market where there are already established players and a well-defined customer base. Think of the smartphone market, for example. If you're launching a new smartphone, you're entering an existing market dominated by the likes of Apple and Samsung. In an existing market, your biggest challenge is differentiation. You need to convince customers to switch from their current solution to yours. This means your product needs to be not just a little bit better, but significantly better, or at least significantly different, to make that switch worthwhile. A resegmented market, on the other hand, is where you take an existing market and carve out a new niche within it. You're not trying to compete head-on with the big players. You're targeting a specific subset of customers with specific needs that aren't being well served by the current offerings. A great example of this is Airbnb. They didn't try to compete with the entire hotel industry. Instead, they resegmented the market by offering unique local accommodations for a different type of traveler. In a resegmented market, your challenge is to deeply understand your target segment and tailor your product to their specific needs and preferences. A new market is, well, exactly that. A market that doesn't yet exist. This is where you're venturing into uncharted territory, creating a product that addresses a need or solves a problem that people may not even know they have yet. Think of the first iPhone. Before it launched, there wasn't really a market for smartphones as we know them today. Apple had to create that market from scratch, educating customers about the possibilities and benefits of this new type of device. In a new market, your biggest challenge is education. You need to not only explain what your product does, but why it matters and how it can change people's lives for the better. Finally, there's the clone market. This is where you take a proven business model that's worked well in one market, usually a more developed one, and replicate it in another market that hasn't yet been tapped. Many of the successful Chinese tech companies fall into this category. They've taken models that worked in the US, like e-commerce, social media or ride-sharing, and adapted them to the Chinese market. In a clone market, your challenge is localization. You need to deeply understand the cultural, social and economic nuances of your target market and adapt your product accordingly. So, why does all this matter? Because your market type should dictate your entire go-to market strategy, the way you position your product, the channels you use to reach customers, the partnerships you forge, the metrics you track, all of these should be informed by your understanding of your market type. If you're in an existing market, for example, you might focus on head-to-head -head comparisons with competitors, highlighting your superior features or value proposition. If you're in a new market, on the other hand, your focus might be more on thought leadership, evangelizing the vision of what this new market could be. Understanding your market type is not a one-time exercise. Markets are constantly evolving, and what might have been a new market yesterday could be an existing market today. As a startup founder, part of your job is to constantly monitor and reassess your market landscape, adapting your strategy as needed. But here's the good news. No matter what type of market you're in, the core principles we've discussed so far still apply. You still need to get out of the building and talk to customers, you still need to build and iterate on an MVP, and you still need to embrace agile development. Your market type is not a constraint. It's a context. It's the frame within which you apply these principles, the lens through which you view your customers and your competition. So as you continue on your startup journey, keep your market type front and center. Use it to guide your decisions to prioritize your efforts and to stay grounded in the realities of your business landscape.
And speaking of staying grounded, that brings us to the fifth and final core idea from the Startup Owner's Manual. In our next segment, we'll explore the ultimate goal of any startup, finding a repeatable and profitable business model. We'll look at what it means to have a truly scalable business, and we'll examine some of the key metrics and milestones that can help you gauge your progress along the way. But for now, your homework is to take a hard look at your own market. What type of market are you in? How does that impact your current strategy? And what might you need to change or adapt based on this new understanding? Remember, the most successful startups are the ones that are ruthlessly customer-focused and market-savvy. They don't just build products. They navigate the complex and ever-changing landscape of their industry, always staying one step ahead. We've explored the importance of treating your startup as a series of hypotheses to be tested. We've learned about getting out of the building and engaging with customers. We've delved into the power of the Minimum Viable product and Aguila development. And we've just wrapped our heads around the crucial concept of market types. But all of this, the customer discovery, the MVPs, the market strategies, it's all in service of one ultimate goal, finding a repeatable and profitable business model. This is the holy grail of startups, the key to unlocking long-term growth and success. So, what exactly do we mean by a repeatable and profitable business model? Let's break it down. Repeatable means that your model isn't just a one-hit wonder. It's not dependent on a single big client, a fleeting market trend, or a burst of viral buzz. Instead, it's a formula that you can apply over and over again to generate consistent results. Think of it like a well-oiled machine. Once you've got all the gears in place, your product, your target market, your sales and marketing strategies, you can crank the handle and watch it churn out growth and revenue in a predictable, scalable way. Profitable, of course, means that you're not just generating revenue, you're doing it in a way that covers your costs and leaves room for reinvestment and growth. This is where a lot of startups stumble. They might have a cool product and even a decent chunk of users, but if their unit economics don't add up, they'll eventually run out of runway. Profitability isn't just about cutting costs, although that's certainly part of the equation. It's also about optimizing your pricing, your customer acquisition strategies, and your overall business model to maximize the lifetime value of each customer. So, how do you know if you've found a repeatable and profitable model? There are a few key indicators. One, consistent, predictable growth. If you can reliably forecast your user growth, revenue, and other key metrics quarter after quarter, that's a good sign you've hit upon something repeatable. 2. Positive Unit Economics This means that the lifetime value of a customer exceeds the cost of acquiring that customer. If you're spending more to get a customer than they'll ever pay you back, that's not sustainable. 3. Scalability can your model grow without being constrained by physical, geographical, or human capital limitations? A truly scalable model should be able to expand rapidly without hitting significant bottlenecks. 4. Defensibility. Is your model easily replicable by competitors, or have you built in some sort of moat, a unique technology, a network effect, a brand loyalty that gives you an edge? Finding this elusive, repeatable and profitable model is no easy feat. It requires a lot of experimentation, a lot of pivots and a lot of perseverance. You might go through dozens of MVPs, hundreds of customer interviews and countless iterations before you nail it. But when you do, when you find that magic formula that allows you to grow and scale with confidence, it's an unparalleled feeling. It's like finding the map to buried treasure after years of searching. Of course, even when you've found your model, the work is never done. 
Markets change, competitors emerge, customer needs evolve. Part of the art of running a startup is knowing when to stick to your guns and when to adapt to new realities. This is where metrics come in. By religiously tracking your key performance indicators, things like customer acquisition cost, lifetime value, churn rate, and more, you can spot trends and make informed decisions about when and how to adjust your model. The book emphasizes the importance of setting up a metrics-driven culture from day one. This means that everyone in your organization, from the CEO to the intern, should be focused on the numbers that matter most to your business. It means making data-driven decisions, not just going with gut instincts. It also means being willing to pivot when the data tells you to. Many of the most successful startups in history, Twitter, Slack, Pinterest, started out as something completely different before finding their true north. The ability to recognize when you need to change course and the agility to execute that change is what separates the winners from the losers in the startup game. So, as you embark on your own startup journey, keep this final goal in mind. Everything you do, every customer interview, every product iteration, every strategic decision should be in service of finding and refining your repeatable and profitable model. It won't be easy. There will be setbacks, failures, and moments of doubt. But armed with the wisdom of the Startup Owner's Manual, and with a relentless focus on your customers and your metrics, you have the tools you need to navigate the choppy waters of entrepreneurship. And remember, even the most successful startups started somewhere. Facebook was once just a dorm room project. Apple began in a garage. Your billion dollar idea might be just one MVP away. So keep pushing, keep learning, and keep believing in the power of your vision. The world needs more bold entrepreneurs, more innovative solutions, and more game-changing businesses. With the right mindset and the right strategies, you could be the next startup success story. That's a wrap on our deep dive into the Startup Owner's Manual. We've covered a lot of ground, from the fundamental mindset shift required to succeed as a startup, to the nitty-gritty tactics of customer development and agile product design. But the journey doesn't end here. In many ways, it's just beginning. The real work is in applying these lessons to your own unique context, in putting these principles into practice day after day, and in staying committed to the long and winding road of startup growth. So as we close this video, I want to leave you with a challenge. Take one action today, just one, to move your startup forward. Maybe it's reaching out to a potential customer for feedback. Maybe it's sketching out your next MVP. Maybe it's reviewing your metrics dashboard with your team. Whatever it is, make it concrete, make it actionable, and make it a habit. Because the secret to startup success isn't just knowing what to do. It's doing it consistently and relentlessly, even in the face of adversity. You have the knowledge, you have the tools. Now it's time to put them to work. So go out there and build something great. The world is waiting for your next big idea.